Thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, welcome to the New America Foundation. I'm Reed Kramer. I direct our asset building program uh, here at the foundation. And uh, our efforts focus on uh, advancing the tools, policies, and resources that help aspiring families uh, move up the economic ladder. And of course, a foundation for this journey for everyone, uh, but particularly families that have lower incomes and fewer resources is education, generally, and specifically higher education. Uh, so I'm very pleased to have this uh, discussion and event today on uh, financing college success, um, innovations to promote readiness, access, and completion. And uh, in recent months, we've seen a lot of attention on the student uh, debt uh, issue for, for good reason. Uh, we know that the uh, current cohort of young adults is having a hard time uh, navigating uh, this economy and finding work that matches their skills and uh, aspirations. Uh, but there's also some troubling uh, news. There was a recent um, report that um, talked about the rising debt levels, even among students that are failing to get degrees and failing to get through uh, college. Uh, and we know that the road to uh, college success is built over time. Um, and importantly, there's a financial component. Um, so today's discussion is going to focus on that connection between student financing, student finances, and college success. Um, this is a relationship uh, that has many facets. Uh, we particularly want to shine a light on uh, the role of savings and the potential of getting students to think about uh, their future, getting ready for college, getting the resources accumulated so they can make it a reality, um, and limiting their need for loans. Um, so elevating the potential of savings um, to, to trigger these effects has, has one, been one of the motivations of our work. Uh, in, um, we've had a project called the College Savings Initiative that we've done in partnership with the Center for Social Development at Washington University. Uh, this past January, we released a series of reports uh, by Willie Elliott, who's here today, that looked at the links between children's savings and educational outcomes. And um, you know, his research, Willie's research that he'll talk about, showed that the college-bound identity that a child might develop begins as early as the fifth grade, and that when students have savings, they're much more likely to go to college, even if they have low incomes. It turns out that there's a number of innovative programs that are underway uh, to break down barriers to college and get students thinking about their future. Um, these include efforts uh, to promote savings accounts with primary and secondary uh, school students. San Francisco is implementing something called the Kindergarten to College uh, Initiative, where they're offering accounts to all of their kindergartners in the public school. Uh, there's a partnership for college completion that's underway in the CHIP uh, the, 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 the KIPP uh, charter schools uh, that's being implemented by the United Negro College Fund and our colleagues at CFED. Um, and a lot of ways that, that we should be looking at um, connecting public benefits to support services and providing access to responsible loans and financial aid. So policymakers really should be asking what interventions can build expectations for college success and, and what tools are available or should be made available that can help students manage their financial lives. So these are the questions I think people should be asking, and I think some policymakers have been asking them. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, Congressman Chaka Fatah uh, with us. Uh, he represents the second uh, congressional district in the great state of Pennsylvania, in the city of Brotherly Love, where I grew up right next door to his district. Um, and among other things, he uh, was one of the chief architects of the Gear Up program. Um, and he's been a big supporter of that effort, which is a program that provides uh, support services to low-income students, uh, middle school and high school students, uh, to get them prepared for college. Um, since it was created in, I think, uh, 1998, it's become, with the congressman's support, one of the country's you know, leading premier uh, college readiness uh, programs. Um, so he's going to talk uh, about, you know, share with us his thoughts on the work of college readiness and awareness, uh, the importance of starting early, and uh, ways in which the Gear Up program uh, can contribute to that process. Uh, we're also very pleased to have uh, with us uh, Martha Cantor, who's Undersecretary 
for the Department of Education. And along with Arnie Duncan, uh, Martha and her colleagues are responsible for implementing the administration's uh, goals, the president's goals, to have the best educated and most competitive workforce uh, in the world and measured by how many people graduate uh, from college over the next decade. She's very focused on the issues of access and affordability, uh, quality and degree completion. And I'll also note that she's been somewhat of a trailblazer in this uh, position because she comes out of the community college world, um, having led one of the nation's largest community college uh, districts. Uh, this morning, the Department of Ed uh, announced plans to pursue a very innovative pilot in the Gear Up uh, program, a demonstration project that will deliver 10,000 accounts, uh, savings accounts, to students participating in the Gear Up program. And they committed to studying the impacts of the intervention and uh, finding ways to leverage that, uh, the, the learnings from that experience into large-scale policy uh, at scale. So this is a very exciting uh, um, endeavor. It's an idea that I've um, written about and thought about with others for a long time, and I think it holds great uh, promise. So if you want to improve long-term educational outcomes, uh, we should get kids thinking about savings, thinking about their future, thinking about what lies ahead, what they need to do to uh, succeed in, in college. So I look forward to hearing more, uh, and uh, we're very pleased to have you all with us today. And let me welcome Congressman Fatah to the podium. Thank you. Well, I haven't been this excited in a long time. This is a great day. And uh, to be here with uh, a number of uh, our friends over the years who we, and we've worked together, uh, but uh, to uh, Dr. Uh, Sanders uh, White, it's good to see you again, and to uh, our esteemed uh, uh, Dr. Elliot III, who's done just, uh, I mean, is the, I think, the uh, leading scholar uh, anywhere uh, on earth uh, on this subject of the, the uh, intertwined relationship between savings uh, and college going. Uh, aspirations for young people. I want to thank him for his uh, service uh, in our military and more importantly his and moreover his, uh, his work now in the academic arena uh, making relevant uh, empirical information to help guide policy. Uh, and to the undersecretary who's uh, engaged in all manner of activities in the most uh, I think energized Department of Education that we've seen uh, for decades uh, in Washington. It's good to see you again. Let me say this. Uh, when I introduced the legislation that created uh, the Gear Up program uh, uh, long ago now, uh, millions of young people uh, have uh, and been impacted with hundreds of programs across the country, and Nathan's here from INSEP, and uh, the work that's been done in all 50 of our states and in our three territories has proven without a doubt that this is as the largest early college uh, awareness and scholarship program in the country that we can indeed uh, impact the college going rates of young people who otherwise would be written off. Uh, but this new uh, addition, uh, which in some ways is not new, but it is different uh, in terms of the way that we're now going to apply an evidence-based approach to it, uh, because uh, in October of uh, um, of uh, 2011, there were some 42 of the new grantees for Gear Up who had savings accounts attached to uh, their, uh, their programs. Uh, but this is going to create a real model uh, that we can draw empirical evidence from uh, by having uh, control groups uh, and using state grantees. So this is a big deal uh, as we go forward uh, because as we look to increase uh, the rate of young people going on to college, meeting the president's goal of leading the world, uh, and the adults are receiving a college degree by 2020. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, and there's no possibility of meeting that goal without uh, creating a larger percentage of college going among the population served by Gear Up. Uh, and rather in uh, South Dakota, in a Native American reservation, or in uh, the Deep South in a state like Mississippi uh, or in urban areas like Philadelphia. Uh, Gear Up has proven that it can work, but we do know something from Dr. Elliott's work, and that is that 
to the degree that we tie actual savings accounts, uh, that it will increase the, the number of students and the adults around them who think about college as the most realistic outcome for these young people. In fact, Senator Coons and I have introduced the bill, uh, the American uh, Dream Act, the American uh, Dream Account Act, uh, which would create a, a emphasis at the national level of the promotion of college savings accounts uh, based in large part off of the work uh, that uh, our esteemed professor has done and that the New America Foundation has been promoting in a variety of ways, which in some cases have already been outlined. Uh, but what we want to do and what Gear Up is all about is taking what works to scale. So this is, uh, you know, uh, it's wonderful to have boutique uh, approaches that work, but what we need to do is impact uh, the tens of millions of young people who are in our schools, and uh, Gear Up is the best vehicle, uh, I think, uh, to proceed along this line. And so I'm happy to be here. I'm excited about this work. I know you're going to have a, a great panel discussion about it. Unfortunately, we're in session. So I just skipped off the floor at the voting and I'm on my way back. Uh, but you can be assured that we want to work with you uh, as we go forward. And for Secretary Duncan and Under Secretary Cantor, uh, the announcement this morning uh, is a, uh, a major step forward. Uh, we obviously will uh, have this work to look on um, as we see the uh, broadening of the empirical evidence and we can quantify uh, much more directly uh, what we know to be true, but we need to see it play out in a variety of, of, uh, of circumstances uh, throughout the country, uh, then we can look uh, to even further uh, integrate this uh, into the uh, Europe and other programs uh, that have similar aims and goals. So thank you for your work. Thank you for your leadership and your scholarship. And I thank the foundation uh, for uh, not giving up on the idea uh, that uh, there is a new America if indeed we're willing to work for it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I don't know if you can see me. I'm not the tallest person in the world. Uh, but I want to thank you, Reed, for you know, your introduction. And Congressman Fatai, you're our hero, uh, especially when it comes to gear up and the possibility of really innovating in a way that's going to help more low-income people have the aspiration for a future that we all would want. Um, I was really happy to um, look back at some of our Pell data over the last couple of years, and we've gone from 6 to 9.8 million Pell students enrolled in college today. And so imagine if we could double that and how much capacity we might have if these savings accounts and the research that will come uh, as a result of this really populate the number of college-going students that this nation is going to need to get us to the 2020 goal, as Congressman Fatah referenced. Um, part of reaching the goal is to really ensure that what I call the top 100 percent of people in this country who want the opportunity to go to college have that opportunity. And savings is really the first stage of the financial pipeline toward what President Obama has characterized as the 2020 goal to get us to best educated, most competitive workforce in the world. So getting there for us, and the President has said this a number of times, and Secretary Duncan and myself, uh, means that we all have to share responsibility to get this done. So for the part, our part in the federal government, working with states, working with all the institutions that came forward to start off, you know, what is a savings account? Look at the research, look at, uh, you know, CFED and all of the research that, you know, you've done, Dr. Elliott and others, to get us to this point is very exciting because we see it's a point of convergence for the country to say we're going to use research, we're going to use evidence, and we're going to track what happens to these young people to get them to say, I am going to college and I will be able to afford it. I was thinking back when you were talking, Congressman Fatan, I was thinking back to a conversation I had with some marketing people when I was a community college president. And um, they said, don't you know, so what, is, what is the group that most influences parents' buying behavior? And I said, well, I'll take a guess. 
and they said middle school students. Middle school students have such power in influencing the buying behavior of parents. So when I think of what we're going to do with the savings accounts and thinking that the Gear Up program will make that available um, in, a, in a research environment to take a look at this, the idea that we are saving for students to go to college and that they will then influence family, the family commitment to that happening is really very, very powerful. But it has to be the shared responsibility of states, the federal government as a catalyst to do the right things and to put the right academic quality behind it so we have the research like you and others are, are continuing to share with us and we can have the results to say we want to do more of this or we want to do it in a different way, but this is really going to be valuable to many, many more, more people. So, you know, I talked a tiny bit about Pell. The federal government has to have and maintain its commitment to strong student aid. We want to incentivize states to do more. They've been, uh, you know, over 80 percent of states have cut public funding for higher education, and we've got to turn that around. We want institutions themselves to moder modernize what's, what's taught in the classroom. We have too much remediation going on. We have to strengthen the partnerships between middle schools, high schools, community colleges, and universities. There's a lot that's being done that we can build on. And today, only 56% of the full-time, first-time freshmen are getting through college in six years. So when you think of the pipeline, you think, you know, we're losing, I think there's a, 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 a statistic, we're losing a young person every 22 seconds in this country. Every 22 seconds, a young person is falling out of the college pipeline. If they know that a savings account is there for them, they learn the financial literacy curriculum that is so desperately needed in young people to say, I'm going to do this for my future and this is why it matters. I think we're going to have a big success story to tell in a few years. Um, we've got institutions of higher education that actually, you know, some institutions are closing the achievement gap. I just got off the phone with Metropolitan State University in Minnesota. You can go local, Towson State University. It is possible to close that achievement gap. What we need to do as a nation is really cut down on the amount of remediation by putting in the pipeline, fixing that pipeline that I talked about so more students can move through faster. And that's really what Gear Up is all about. Gear Up is taking middle school and high school students, wrapping around services, looking at curriculum that is much more modern than maybe 50 years ago when I taught reading to young people, um, and move students through much more quickly. But students need to know that they can afford college. You know, getting across the finish line has to do with price, and it has to do with planning, and it has to do with the whole family system, whether, you know, it's a state or a federal government taking care in local apprentice of a foster youth person who's in middle school, or whether it's someone in a family that doesn't have the means that does want to have a future. So when we think about students and families, you know, they have a responsibility in addition to states, in addition to the federal government, and in addition to the, to the institutions of higher education to say we are going to make a commitment to save for college. We are going to fill out a FAFSA, Federal Student Aid Application, thanks to Congressman Fatah and others in this room, you know, put in place direct lending and cut out almost half of the questions on the FAFSA. And, you know, I keep going back to Michael Dannenberg and other people in our office saying, we won't need a FAFSA in the 21st century. We should know, the family should know that they qualify. And that should be the vision that, you know, we should make it easy. We do it in Social Security. You know, you get, a, you know, everybody in this room gets a letter from Social Security Administration uh, every spring as to what, um, what you made and what you can count on in your retirement from the SSA. Why don't we do that with FAFSA? So, I mean, we have some big ideas to put forward, and really it's going to be a menu of ideas that couple what the Gear Up program has long now proven, that we need to implement the strategies that will, will lead us to the success that we want for students. And we want families to really compare. You know, someone was telling me the other day, um, too many students choose only one campus. When you look at the FAFSA application, they put in one campus. So we want families to make good choices, and cost is going to be a big reason why you choose College A or College B if you couple 
that financial decision with the quality that you'll receive at that institution. So we want students and families to really migrate to high performing institutions with good solid graduation rates where students graduate with little or no debt or minimal amount of debt or debt that they can afford. And when you couple all of that together, I think we can do a whole lot in the financial literacy area through this pipeline that is going to be so essential for success. So to move us forward, we're going to stay, take big steps. Um, you heard about the investing in innovation competition and race to the top. We've got some principles for action that we're building on. We want to create an evidence base. Uh, to do this kind of research, and we're really excited that Gear Up is going to have the college savings account research that will be a demonstration project for us to move forward on. Um, we want to build on the evidence. We want uh, to provide 10,000 Gear Up high school students with these savings accounts. They'll have their own accounts. They'll have seed and matching funds. And I think this is going to be a spur to other people. I know when I was a college president, raised a ton of money for scholarships. I'd be putting, with what I know now, three years later after joining the administration, I would have put a, scholar, a, you know, a scholarship savings account for middle school and high school students. And I think we have that vision. Um, each account will be seeded with $200. It'll be matched up to $480. We'll have a total of over thousand dollars for students to have when they enroll in college. We can couple that with Pell Grants, couple that hopefully with the restoration of state aid, especially to public institutions, and couple that with philanthropy and other means so that students can really put a financial package together that their families will say, this is affordable and I will do it. Um, on the back end, you know, all of the public service loan forgiveness and all of the uh, information about the American Opportunity Tax Credit that you're hearing about, you know, package up on the back end as well as the front end. So getting back to the savings account, as I said, this really is the first stage of the financial pipeline toward that 2020 goal. America cannot afford not to invest in the future. And so these, this research and, and the gear up savings accounts are going to really put us on a great path forward. So I want to thank you for having me. And now I'll just turn this back to Reed for the panel to come up and share with us their, their expertise and insight. Thanks so much. Um, OK, let's bring our panel up uh, here. Uh, Willie's here. Evelyn, you're here. Uh, did Kevin make it yet? Let's see. He might come in, and, and Deborah. Great. Well, why don't you um, have a seat? Are you going to speak from uh, here? Anyway, okay. Um, Right, we're going to have this panel uh, that's going to discuss the role of student finances uh, in the process of gearing up uh, for college. Um, I'll introduce the panelists. They'll go in order, and then we'll open it up for discussion among them and uh, among you in the, uh, in the room. Uh, Willie Elliott uh, III is assistant professor in the School of Social Work at the University of Kansas. Uh, previously, he was at the uh, University of Pittsburgh. Um, and he's done, uh, as the congressman mentioned, a lot of groundbreaking work uh, in this area. Uh, in January, we released uh, the series uh, called Financial Stake in College. Financing, what was it called? <laughs> Financing? Creating. Creating a Financial Stake in College. That was it. It had four, four parts to it. Um, and uh, a lot of really important kind of background material for, uh, that's related to the Gear Up demonstration, as well as a lot of other children's savings account uh, efforts. Uh, Deborah Saunders White is Deputy Assistant Secretary for Higher Education Programs at the U.S. Department of Education. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. And, and gear up your responsibility, right? Okay, so you're in charge of getting this demonstration off the ground and, and running, among other things. So we're going to get her perspective uh, as well. And then Evelyn um, Gansglass, uh, over there on the far right, nice to see you, uh, is at the Center for Law and Social Policy, and she directs their uh, workforce development. Uh, CLASP, in, in general, does great work, um, and uh, y her work with her colleagues now uh, is exploring the potential, uh, the potential hel helpful role that public benefits play uh, in um, getting students to pursue post-secondary education uh, degrees. They're involved in a very interesting pilot with a network of community colleges, uh, looking at uh, the role that, that public benefits play. So she'll share her um, perspective uh, as well. And kind of what unites uh, public benefits and, and savings uh, is this broader 
uh, student financial life that I'm, I'm referring to. And, and uh, we want to you know, look at the, the bigger role that, that, that's played about how finances can, can help students get to and also get through uh, college. Uh, Kevin Carey is going to be joining us. He, um, uh, his daughter had a dentist appointment that evidently he couldn't get out of uh, the, doing the delivery, but he, he should show up momentarily. Um, and also say uh, we're very pleased that he'll be here, assuming he gets here. But uh, next week he's joining us as director of our uh, education policy program here at uh, New America. He does great work. We're really pleased uh, to welcome here. He, previously, he, he's been um, policy director at the education sector, but he's coming to take over our education policy program that was launched in 2006 by Michael Dannenberg, who did excellent work uh, getting it launched and started and is still doing excellent work, uh, working with Undersecretary uh, Cantor and her team. Um, so. Um, thanks, Michael, for all of your work getting this over the finish line and for your work previously at, at New America. Um, okay, so that's the uh, lineup. Uh, Willing, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, are you comfortable there? Or you want the podium? You're comfortable there. Okay, well, any of you can be invited to speak from the, the table or come up to the podium. And after you go, I'll flag you down from the front if you're going on too long. Uh, but then we'll open it up for uh, questions. Great. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I like this. The, the dentist story, I, I like real life things. I mean, you know, real life continues on all the time, so that's great. Uh, I am not a public speaker, I'm a researcher, so I'm gonna stick to my notes and I will be uh, hopefully uh, on time. So, and, and, and these are more non-academic uh, uh, comments, uh, and then I'll mention some of the findings at, towards the end. So philosopher uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein wrote a book called Uncertainty. In this book, he talks about the groundlessness of our beliefs. He proposes that before we begin to doubt anything, we must first assume some things to be true. See, doubting requires a certain level of knowledge. You, must, uh, <clears throat> you know this from your years in school and learning new things in your everyday lives. When you first begin to learn something, you begin by memorizing facts and listening to others. And only later do you begin to think critically about what you're learning. That is doubt, begin to doubt things and raise questions. In the social sciences, assumptions are a type of theory based on non-scientific grounds. Assumptions gives us the knowledge we need to be, to be able to begin to raise questions about things that matter to us as researchers. I will discuss two basic assumptions that I make about the world that allow me to begin to question what it will take to truly make education a great equalizer in society. These assumptions or theories underlie my thinking and work on children's savings. The first theory I call the theory of average intelligence. When I think about intelligence, I think about it in this way. If you had, intelligen if you had an intelligence scale, zero to 10, most people would fall somewhere around five, to include myself. In statistics, we might, we might say something like, the data are normally distributed. Being of average intelligence here is not referring to the level of intelligence a person has at age 42 or age six, but at the moment prior to genes being influenced by the environment. The point at which genes begin to be influenced by the environment might occur before a person is even born. My theory of average intelligence leads me to conclude that many of the differences we see in academic performance are due to differences in effort and environmental factors. So on the one hand, you may have two children, both poor and of average intelligence. However, they perform very differently in school due to different levels of effort. On the other hand, you may have two children who have similar levels of effort and both are of average intelligence, uh, but in this scenario, one child outperforms the other due to differences in their environment. For example, low-income, high-achieving children enrolling in college at lower rates than high-income, uh, high-achieving children. Or maybe more concerning, low-income children, uh, low-income, high-achieving children enrolling in college at similar or lower rates than high-income, low-achieving children, as we see in American society. This first, the first scenario aligns well with the typical person's notion of the American dream. That effort really should be the deciding factor in who succeeds and who fails when you have children with similar abilities. The second scenario leaves us all feeling like something is wrong with the education system. Therefore, I suggest it is better to focus on research, theory, and policies that attempt to understand and address the second scenario. It is, it is worth pointing out some differences in effort might actually stem from differences in environment when it comes to school. That is, environment can influence a level of effort. My second theory is equally simple, and it can be called the Iron Man theory. 
For those of you like me who love the Avengers, I saw it four times, uh, <laughs> you know that the Iron Man character is a man named Tony Stark who wears a computerized iron suit. He even has an energy source that was surgically implanted into his chest and now powers the Iron Man suit and keeps Tony Stark's alive. Um, not, nothing more, more exciting than that, right? If we could just do that. The Iron Man character provides a visual illustration of how technology augments a person's ability, allowing the person to accomplish what she could, she could not on her own. When I think of the Iron Man theory, I think in a highly specialized, technological, global society like we have today, it is no longer simply about what a person can do on their own through individual resources, effort, and ability. It is increasingly about the knowledge the person has to use societal resources and the access they have to the resources to augment their individual resources. Yes, there's a second page. An, implications, uh, an implication of this for me is that the American dream can no longer be achieved through the simple formula that many of us grew up believing in, in, believing in, in trying to make work in our own lives. That is, adding efforts, enough effort to enough ability to produce desired outcomes. To every problem, to every failure, there is a simple retort, work harder. It echoes in my mind almost constantly. While this remains an important part of the formula, it is not as simple as just working harder anymore. It is a hard thing to accept and maybe individuals should not, but societies must have a more reasoned view so that effort continues to lead to desired outcomes for individuals and the dream continues to live in, in a, to live on in society for the majority of people, not just for the advantaged. Even if individuals themselves do not recognize work, the work of society in their lives. Advantage here could mean an effort, an effort advantage, extremely high self-efficacy that allows you to hope when there is no reason to hope. Ability advantage, uh, just so darn smart, right? Or an environmental advantage, wealthier than the rest. The formula for achieving the American dream has been changed in the modern world, whisked out in the middle of the night, leaving many unaware that it ever changed. They still labor, trust, and devise theories and policies based on the old paradigm for achieving success. It's no longer a time when you can give a person a piece of land and they can work that land in isolation and achieve success. In the modern world, there is, new, there is a new formula where ability and societal resources have become so integrated that even the individual doing the work can hardly discern where individual effort begins and societal resources cease. They function as the pumping of the heart does. You don't know it's pumping until your chest tightens. Or in the case when societal resources cut off, a school is closed, an internet connection is lost, a teacher underperforms. In this, and this is the way it should be, hidden in the background. In my research, in, in the case of children's savings policies, when we talk of societal resources or environmental factors, we have thought mostly about economic factors, and in particular, financial assets. This is not to suggest that it is the only important societal resource, but that it has been understudied, an understudied factor in the field of education, and it, and it is something that policy can do more easily than some other things. Institutions provide people with access and command over financial assets. Moreover, in a capitalistic society, individual financial assets provide people with capacity to participate in, negotiate with, influence, control, and hold accountable institutions that affect their lives. That is, assets beget assets. When, when we provide people with individual assets, we are essentially providing them with the power to access and command institutions needed to reach the American dream in the modern world. If this is the case, the opposite is also true. When we deny people access to individual assets, we are essentially denying them access and command over the institutions they need to reach the American dream. Whether we deny them today or we denied them in the times past, the result is an uneven playing field that effort alone is most, in most cases cannot overcome. Children's savings accounts might be a way to build children's assets and in turn give children, children capacity to participate in, negotiate with, influence, control, and hold accountable institutions that affect their lives. Children's savings accounts or, save, or savings or investment accounts that can begin as early as birth. They allow parents and children to accumulate savings for post-secondary education, home ownership, or in some cases, business initiatives. In many cases, public and private matching funds are deposited into these accounts to supplement savings for the child, and despite this, they do not teach children to sit at home, as some might suggest. 
they teach children that effort mixed with societal resources is a new formula for reaching uh, the American dream, giving them a, a sense of pride in the institutions of this country. The meta message is, you pay your share, we'll pay our share, is a recognition of the individual and society that each must invest if either is to be successful. So what does the research generally teach us about the effects of having saving, a savings account as a child? That children with a savings account are more likely to attend college. That having an account appears to be more important for lower income children than higher income children. That both black children and white children benefit from having an account in regards to their uh, college outcomes. There is some evidence, but less, that children have better math outcomes as well. There is growing evidence that short-term savings, liquid assets, might also be important for children's educational outcomes, as are long-term savings, particularly among lower-income children. Farther, children who have savings are more likely to have savings over the life course and more saved than similarly situated children without savings. How do we think, of, how do we think asset effects occur? By changing children's expectations about the future, giving them the, the ability to find reasoned hope as opposed to requiring them to hope when most reasonable people would not. We also think that these effects may occur not so much because of how much children save. Most children in these studies, which don't study CSAs per se or children's savings per se, but a savings in a bank like Bank of America, have saved on average around $400, not a lot of money. We speculate that we might still see effects even when very low savings, uh, even with very low savings because while the purchase of college is yet far away, it is less about the amount of money saved and more about what children expect they can save in the future with an account. However, these findings uh, come from secondary data sets. As a result, we cannot rule out that other factors may explain the effects of children's savings. Moreover, findings are limited by smaller sample sizes and other times by the types of questions available in the data sets and the, the, the way the variables are measured. Uh, and that's why these, this new initiative is so important. I will end where I started with Ludwig Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein said, when we first begin to believe anything, what we believe is not a single proposition. It is a whole system of propositions. It is not a single axiom that strike me as obvious. It is a system in which consequences, consequences and premises uh, give one another mutual support. Research is much the same way. It is not a single study that persuades us, but a set of studies using a variety of methods combined with our lived experiences that gradually persuades us. What this research on the emerging system of what this research or the emerging system of propositions has persuaded me of is that the idea of children's savings is worth a closer look and more rigorous examination. When combined with a, a program like such as Gear Up, children's savings may just play an important role in helping to restore the education path as a great equalizer in society. That's in my Well, good afternoon, everyone. I have the pleasure this afternoon of being the voice for the Department of Education as it relates to this demonstration project. But before I go through the details of what the project truly is, I'd like to give credit where credit's due. I have several colleagues here that I'd like to um, recognize. Michael Dannenberg, Phil Martin, and Stephanie Schmidt, and also Linda Burr Johnson who are all part of this team that made this day a possibility. You've heard the, the, the acronym GEAR UP, and I, I'd like to make sure we all understand what that acronym is. It really is gaining early ac awareness and readiness for undergraduate programs. And it's important that we start that way because I, as I give you the specifics of this research demonstration project, we keep that in mind. I know we gear up becomes a convenient word, and I've been in government now for about a year, and I know it's heavy laden with acronyms, but um, really this is a discretionary grant program. Uh, this year we saw about $302 million in the program. It is a program focused on middle and high school students preparing these low-income students for a better opportunity. And we define that better opportunity as higher education. It is very fitting for me to, to sit next to you, Dr. Elliott, and to hear your comments about the research that is currently in the field. 
The department reviewed this research and felt that it was extremely promising, yet we felt we needed to add to that body of research to help influence policy. Therefore, today, uh, announced as a uh, an announced for public review, I think is the appropriate term, and formally announced in the Federal Register tomorrow is an opportunity for the public to respond to the department's initial ideas regarding this demonstration project. Let me give you a few details about what we have formulated thus far and what you will see in the Federal Register tomorrow. This is a project that the department is proposing to use $8.7 million from fiscal year 2012 federal gear up funds to carry out this college savings account demonstration project. We intend to use these funds focusing very specifically on states. As you know, as some of you know, the gear up program has a state component and it also has a partnership component. We will be focusing on states and particularly those states that have cohorts, uh, have, have a cohort approach to implementation. And I'll explain why that's so key uh, as I move forward. We intend, and as you heard Secretary Cantor, Under Secretary Cantor remark that we are intending to focus on 10,000 students. 10,000 students will be in, a, uh, in our experimental group, and 10,000 students would be in our control group. It is our objective with our partnership with the Institute of Educational uh, Sciences, IES, Stephanie's here representing. Uh, it is our intent to develop this rigorous randomized study where we will have data to support, I hope, your research, Dr. Elliott, that children's savings accounts have make a difference um, in uh, a student's opportunities or ability to go to college. Why gear up? Well, gear up has a statutory authority that allows us to provide uh, financial counseling and financial uh, literacy resources. So it's just a natural fit for us to apply this particular demonstration project focused on savings account to this program. Gear up currently serves about 700,000 students. Um, we have about 26 different states. Uh, involved. However, with this cohort approach that we are taking, um, there will be 13 states that would be eligible for this particular uh, project. What's the specifics of the, uh, the program as we have defined in our notice? Um, again, it's $8.7 million. $2 million will be set aside for states for implement or administration. And how ironic for us to have a meeting this morning with our friends from INSEP, um, where we didn't talk much about this. <laughs> Nathan, um, so we did want to steal the Secretary's thunder. But the concern that they raised this morning was the fact that there were no funds set aside to help administer these type of, um, these type of programs. Clearly, what we are, uh, our objective is to change behavior and to influence the opportunity for more students to have, an, uh, have uh, an opportunity for a better life. What we hope will happen is that, um, that students will see in their families, will take advantage of this, this program, and um, will uh, have re additional resources to attend uh, an institution of uh, post-secondary uh, education. What we will do with those successful grantees um, who are providing uh, a cohort kind of implementation is that in the ninth grade, students will receive a $200 seed uh, from us, from the federal government. These monies will be deposited in a uh, federally guaranteed kind of account. Um, and then if this, the students would then, we would ask them to match 
uh, on a monthly basis, $10 a month for four years, which adds up to about $480. If they provide those funds, the federal government would then match those for $480. So at the end of the four-year period, that student's family, that student and its his, his or her family would have uh, $1,160 uh, $1, to, uh, uh, to help them defray some of the cost of higher education. But more importantly, I think as you've stated, Dr. Elliott, I, I really, I wrote that down because this notion of reasoned hope, I think is imperative in this, this process. Our friends in IES will, con uh, will be conducting the study. Um, we will obviously post or present data at the end of the study, which is uh, scheduled to be in 2020. Uh, how ironic that it matches the uh, president's goals uh, for delivery. But uh, we will also look at um, publishing on an annual basis given the current gear up annual performance plans that are required. We will be gleaming from those data um, information relative to the success of the, uh, this program. I think it's also important uh, to note that a program uh, focused on savings cannot be successful with just an allocation of resources. Those resources must be accompanied with uh, appropriate uh, financial literacy training. And we not only will uh, hope or require that our grantees provide that, what we will do is help our grantees understand those elements by providing technical assistance. What we are requiring is that the grantees would twice a year hold some type of financial literacy uh, workshop for um, the students and um, their parents and that this would total about 12 hours of instructions, if, instruction, if you will, so that the entire family has a perspective of the value of, uh, of savings and what this would mean for the possibility of a better future. So this opportunity to, that you have starting tomorrow is a 30-day window. And that 30-day window, we are most sincere in our desire to seek your best advice uh, to us relative to the notice that we've published. And so the, the entire notice is, is available for your comment, but I draw your particular attention to uh, helping us uh, define the merits and drawbacks of the different types of college savings accounts and whether a single type of account should be prescribed for the project. In addition, any comments that you have relative to directory information. And directory information really bleeds over into that FERPA world and um, helping us understand uh, how directory information could be used to open accounts without the need of a social security number or other tax identification number to facilitate automatic enrollment. And that's really the key. You know, you'll see in our notice this, this comment and this requirement for grantees to set up a, an account that allows for automatic enrollment. Um, and so those that are interested in participating in this demonstration project, we want the, the student and the parent to be able to, um, they, they will automatically be included and then they'd have to opt out. Um, so we would invite your comments um, about that. And then we'd invite your comments about the expected take up rate for the, for the um, savings account. You know, we're, we're excited about the possibility of what the data will look like for us in, in aggregate and, and also in a disaggregated uh, form. So um, we are been working very closely with IES in such a way that um, we will be able to provide that type of information as a result of the study. And what we would hope is that this study 
would help frame the opportunity for many more studies, many more opportunities to come and will help us on the policy side of, of the House. Um, the specific account structures that we're, we're asking uh, states to engage in, we're fairly flexible there um, for the student component. You know, 529s are pretty popular in some states. However, it doesn't necessarily require that states embrace a 529. But it does require that states invest in and have a, an administrator and a trustee for these accounts. And so I invite you, as you read the notice, to pay particular attention to how the department or what the department is looking for in terms of the commitment for these states moving forward in ensuring that, that these accounts are well protected um, and really are used for their intended um, purposes. So the announcement, again, I said will be formally be published next uh, tomorrow. You have 30 days from tomorrow to give us your most robust uh, comments. Linda and her team are going to be available uh, to digest those, and I hope that as a result of the type of collaboration that I hope will exist in the next 30 days, a result in the next 30 days, that we will publish a notice inviting application early in um, um, uh, August so that we can make these awards by the end of September. And our objective really is to have the first ninth grader receive a savings account starting in the academic year of, of 2013-14. So we're fairly aggressive in what we want to achieve. We're excited about the possibilities. And I think I'll stop there, and I, I think we'll have some questions later. Yes. So I'll, I'll stop there to entertain any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kevin, welcome. Thank you. We did introduce you in your absence. Uh, Evelyn, why don't you make okay. your comments first, and then, and then Kevin, you can have uh, sure. some, some cleanup. Okay, thank you. I'd like to just spend a few minutes talking not about children's savings account, but as, um, as mentioned, about the financial needs of the very diverse community college student, many of whom are older, many have family responsibilities, uh, many, many of them are low income. And while there's an assumption of affordability at community colleges, if you take into account the cost of living expenses, of books, of transportation, of childcare, of all the things that have to be provided for somebody to actually attend community college, the, the financial burden on the, on the student is still very high. Um, it's less than at the four-year institutions. In 2010, uh, the estimated cost uh, for attendance at a community college was $14,637, which is much more than just the tuition, obviously compared to 20,339 for a four-year um, student. Um, the reason, um, so, so the, the, the financial burden is very high, um, and yet there is tremendous unmet financial need, even after you take into account uh, all of the financial aid that the student may get. In fact, 80% of, community college students have unmet financial need after the, the financial aid calculations have been made compared to 54% of um, public four-year college students. Uh, not surprisingly, given that situation, 85% of community college students really combine work and education uh, to meet their own um, living expenses as well as those of their families. One-third of students work full-time. Um, and we know that while part-time work is actually a positive contributor to education, working, uh, working excessive hours, and I would say full-time employment while going to school full-time um, is excessive, really um, hurts 
uh, students' achievement in college, completion rates, persistence rates, et cetera, and prolongs the whole process because they have to go to school part-time. There's um, growing interest in a set of interventions, of strategies to try to uh, improve the financial stability of community college systems that go beyond uh, traditional fi financial aid. Um, and these include increasing financial assets, and you've talked about that as children's savings accounts, but uh, for adults as well, um, access to public benefits, emergency loans, uh, increasing financial literacy um, activities as part of developmental education, as part of, um, you know, the first courses that co students take in, in colleges. And then there are a whole set of activities to help people gain employment, uh, working part-time, whether it's work-study as part of financial aid or private sector employment. Um, on the public benefit side, we're really focusing on a range of benefits as well as uh, tax credits. Most um, low-income students uh, who are working would probably be eligible for EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit. Uh, very many of them will be, if their parents, will be eligible for their children for the uh, uh, S-CHIP program for health insurance for, for children. Uh, fewer would be eligible for TANF welfare or food stamps, now called SNAP, or other assistance. Clearly, parents are going to be eligible for more things than uh, not, than, than single students. Um, and immigrants and non-residents are probably going to be uh, the least eligible. But there's a full range of, of possibilities, and, and we're busily exploring all of all of those. Um, the idea is to provide the financial stability, enable students to work less, study more, uh, take on less debt, uh, pay their tuition and fees on time, and all of these things together hopefully will contribute to, um, to uh, improved um, student persistence and completion. Unfortunately, many students are unaware of the benefits to which they, may, they or their children may be entitled. Uh, they don't know about them. They don't have the time to go down to the human service office or whatever office is necessary to apply. And they just, um, you know, don't, um, don't apply for it and also don't persist in staying active even if they do initially comply because they don't make they don't have the time for their visits and, and all of that. So we um, have been involved in a number of initiatives now to t test out different strategies. Um, we're working with a number of community colleges. Uh, we're doing some policy research around these questions of whether access and receipt of these benefits, um, including the services of financial literacy, et cetera, will actually contribute to improved um, retention, progress, and completion. And I just want to mention a couple of these um, projects. Um, uh, one of them we're calling Benefits Access for College Completion. We're working with the American Association of Community Colleges, and we're just finishing the, the planning stage of that, so I can't tell you which colleges are uh, going to be part of that. We're just maybe two weeks away from announcing that, but there will be um, most likely seven colleges around the country that are going to um, really try to integrate benefits access into their ongoing work at the community college, whether it's part of the financial aid office, whether it's part of ser uh, student services, um, they're trying it with volunteers, they're trying it with a whole variety of ideas. The key is to implement these strategies in a sustainable way at low enough costs so that in fact it becomes embedded um, in the everyday practices of community colleges. We're far away from knowing exactly which strategies work and even further away to have the evidence that in the long run it will um, succeed, but there's early evidence from a number of these strategies that, in fact, semester-to-semester uh, -semester persistence has, um, has improved. 
Um, as part of this benefits access to college con completion initiative, we're also starting a learning community that really will bring together national organizations as well as a whole range of um, colleges throughout the country that are involved in these various strategies that I, I talked to you about. Um, and the problem at the moment is that each one of them, as with many other things, are operating in isolation. So they're a group that are um, pursuing financial literacy and they're part that are dealing with scholarships and emergency loans and there are others that are dealing with benefits and there really hasn't been very much communication uh, across those to figure out what the overlap and interactions are between these policies and to understand what works in student outreach and, and other issues such as that. Um, and we're about to kick that off. So if any of you are interested in, in the learning community, please come up and, and talk to um, us and, and Abby New Newcomer, who just walked in, in in the back of the room, who's um, leading a lot of this work. Uh, um, she and I just spent the day with um, a number of community college folks and the Annie Casey Foundation that's interested in scaling up uh, an approach called Centers for Working Families, uh, again, within the community college um, uh, context. And that initiative um, has a, a number of components. The premise is that the single interventions really aren't enough for most students that have, that are more at risk in, in, in a failure in institutions. And so the idea is to link a number of strategies together. So there's the linking, the bundling at component of it, and there are three broad categories. Um, again, access to financial aid, public benefits, other resources, uh, services to improve financial knowledge, budgeting skills, um, uh, choice of financial products, and you've talked about that earlier, and then workforce ser services to help people with career planning and actually connect them to work. So it's a matter of bundling these services in appropriate ways for different students. And then the final um, effort that we're involved in is really a policy research activity where we're, we're, we're looking at the in potential positive and negative interaction among financial aid and all of these other benefit um, projects. The notion is that at the federal level, uh, the Higher Education Act says in determining financial aid, we won't take into account receipt of any of these other financial um, supports. And in these other programs, financial aid is not supposed to be taken into account. For the most part, that's true, although we've identified several glitches where the law, they forgot and they're in direct conflict with each other and in quite a few cases where there's just a lot of confusion, especially at the state level where all different kinds of decisions are being made. But the interesting thing that we've learned is even when there aren't direct conflicts, it's really the whole sequencing of how you put together a package of supports for students really determines what they're going to be eligible for or how much they're going to receive. So um, from a student perspective, which is not the way many of these decisions are made, um, it really does matter which door you walk into and where you start in this whole process. And hopefully over time we'll be able to sort a lot of this out and have some impact on the field to, to try to package these benefits in a, in a more beneficial way. Thanks. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, the, the New America Foundation's asset building program has been making important contributions to this, these kinds of ideas for a, a number of years now. And I, and I confess that the first time that um, I was uh, uh, confronted by them or came across the idea of uh, subsidizing um, college savings accounts in a variety of forms for low-income students, my reaction was, it seems like a good idea. It also seems kind of complicated, and why not just take that money and use it to increase Pell Grants or make, make college cheaper? Um, what, what I have since been, uh, the answer, and I think it's a very good answer, and what I've, I've since been, been really persuaded by um, is this notion of college savings accounts as a means of engaging students and families. Um, much earlier in the decision-making process. 
um, that it's about uh, uh, families investing in the future of their kids at, at the same time that they have a sense that um, society is investing in them. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, we know that a lot of the important decisions that uh, families will make um, that will ultimately determine whether their students go to college and if they go to college, whether they succeed there, happen many, many years before they're confronted with um, the FAFSA and a lot of the kind of conventional instruments of financial aid. I mean, we're talking about course making decisions that go back into the middle school grades. Um, we know that the, uh, the psychology and the decision making process that, that families and students go through when they decide uh, whether to go to college, where to go to college, how to pay for it, is very, very complicated. Um, it, much more so than simply being a matter of uh, having enough money to write a check uh, at, at a, certain, a certain time. Um, there is a complex cost-benefit analysis that goes on uh, formally or informally. Um, and uh, uh, as the overall price of college continues to rise, which is a, a, a uh, a, a topic for another day or probably another week or month or, or um, uh, uh, that cost benefit calculation becomes um, more tenuous for some students um, and it becomes all the more important that we achieve that kind of uh, sustained engagement between families and uh, the path to higher education uh, and so what I think has been you know really interesting and in some ways kind of revelatory about the research that the foundation and the program have sponsored and the papers that came out earlier this year and the contributions that my fellow panelists have made is really starting to kind of nail down the, the specifics of those dynamics, the benefits of this kind of engagement, which are, you know, indeed financial and, and um, uh, particularly for students who are economically marginal, um, particularly when prices are, you know, uh, going up, it really can make a difference about whether you've, you've been able to put some of that money aside. But uh, also this broader sense um, that we don't wait for people to be of, quote, college age, or, or that perhaps we redefine what the, the phrase college age really means um, in building programs that signal uh, to them uh, this notion that if college uh, is the right path for them, and it will be for most of them, um, that, uh, that society is ready to make that commitment um, and that it expects a commitment in return. And I think it really is that, um, that sense of uh, um, that dual commitment uh, which is kind of embodied in the dollars and cents of these, of these savings programs, but, but sort of much more so the notion of it that really um, does sustain people through what inevitably will be a bumpy road along the path to college. I mean, many people, um, uh, it's a relatively small number of people for whom the path to enrolling and affording and paying for college is, is smooth. Um, uh, those people are highly overrepresented here in Washington, D.C., um, but for the broad populace, I mean, it really is, there are many, many uh, uh, points along the way where people can be diverted, um, where their momentum can flag, where they can be confronted with what seem like, uh, uh, you know, short-term choices that might make sense that really aren't in their long-term best interests. And so uh, the, uh, the way that these kind of programs can um, anchor them and, and, and and uh, affirm that commitment again earlier in their in their lives. I think uh, has a lot of potential, and so excited to see the Department of Education um, participating in this and the rollout of these new programs, and um, and glad to see that these ideas are coming to fruition. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you um, okay, uh, let's open up the conversation to uh, those in the room um, and uh, among the panelists. We have a mic that will rove around. Uh, we have a question here. If you can let me know if you have a um, comment or question, that would be great. Uh, Deborah, it does seem to me, though, that uh, you be, we've gotten some marching orders today, which is to, to look at this notice uh, quite closely and to, to give uh, feedback to the department within the next 30 days. And that's both on the um, design of the demonstration and I assume also on the evaluation side uh, as well. Um, and you mentioned we have some colleagues here that have um, played a role in, in thinking about that uh, side. So if, if there's some um, comments that they might have or you might have about that evaluation, um, we can have, uh, get to that as well. Um, I, I will say that you know, what, what's exciting about this is, 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 is the intervention, but it's also the potential learning and doing it at scale so it can inform policy uh, change going forward. Uh, you know, we want to see evidence-based policymaking generally. Uh, but we, we don't want just the, the demonstration and the learnings to accumulate. We want to inform policy. We want to see 
see that um, change as well. So um, uh, that's uh, obviously going to unfold over time here, but I, I think that in the rollout, it's quite promising the way you guys have structured it. So um, a lot of accolades, uh, I think, are warranted to you and your team. Uh, okay, let's start with a question here. Yes, my name is uh, Jamal Abdulalim. I'm a correspond correspondent with uh, diverse issues in higher education. Uh, just a few few questions relative to the uh, the savings accounts. I was hoping someone could speak just a little bit about uh, potential eth ethical concerns about having a control group. Um, you know, if I were a student and I found out, you know, 10, 15 years later that I was part of a control group and I could have got something that, you know, intuitively people believe is beneficial to higher education, I think I might be a little bit upset about that. Um, the other thing would be um, uh, five to nines. I know performance kind of varies um, uh, by state, if I'm not mistaken. So perhaps you could speak a bit about um, the requirements for the savings accounts um, that would be eligible to participate in this. Um, uh, in terms of the, the cap, you mentioned that people could save $480 and then the federal government would match. And I was wondering, well, if you, if you have a situation where some people don't max that out, then that would, I guess that would be extra money and you know why cap it at 480 if maybe there's extra money for those who want to save a little bit more and that seems like that would be a stronger incentive for savings you know that hey if you save 600 we'll 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 match it at 600 because you know some people might not participate then the last thing would be um you know those of you that are familiar with i3 um you know you know that there's this um component where there's um uh, some type of requirement for a philanthropic match for some of the grantees. And so I was wondering what would be the potential to have, um, in addition to having the federal government match the savings to actually get, you know, some buying and investment from nonprofits in the regions where the grantees are, are, are serving gear up students. Right. Great. Thank you. Let me take your last question uh, first. I appreciate um, your series of questions. Um, what we are hopeful, you know, this is a demonstration project, and what we are hopeful that will, uh, of what will happen is that with the interest, with the federal interest in children's savings accounts and, and matching it with a program like Gear Up that already has a final financial literacy program in uh, as part of it. And also, um, I mentioned that there's a cohort you know, uh, that this is open to states that have a cohort element uh, and, and states that have received the 2011-2012 awards um, are uh, ones that are indeed eligible. The reason why we put that cohort piece in there is because we think that those states have already made an investment in um, working globally with those students in the Gear Up program. Uh, on financial literacy and could indeed have scholarship funds or have its uh, administrators already in place. So it wouldn't be a, a harder start for them uh, uh, to move forward to embrace um, the savings account. Your question and what we are hopeful of for is some of the fine work that NSEP has already been doing over the last year. Um, we announced this, the uh, the we announced the idea of savings accounts as part of the Gear Up uh, competition in 2011. And that was an invitational priority, and many states or many folks saw that as kind of a signal from the department to start really in thinking about it and starting to make investments. And I can tell you that we've already received many calls from those successful grantees who are already thinking about children's savings accounts, already reaching out to the private sector, trying to find uh, additional resources to, do, to, to actually start moving on, on this project. So we're hopeful that um, that community will, will continue to grow and will, will, will be uh, realized. Um, the cap, you know, you, that's an interesting concept. I, you know, I welcome that as a, comp, uh, a com, uh, comment uh, to the notice that we've just published or will be publishing tomorrow in terms of what happens if, if uh, folks really accelerate. You know, we're dealing with just a finite 
pot of money right now. Um, and, you know, if students are not, uh, if parents and students are not putting it in the account and they, they, if they sit, if those, those things are, if those accounts are not matched over a six year period, then that, that money comes back to, tr uh, to the department. Um, and then, you know, if there, that money does suns sunset if we don't redistribute it back to Treasury. And so I would welcome that comment in terms of if you've got an approach of, of how to accelerate that use with those additional, with funds not used. Um, because, you know, we, this is not a program that's cast in stone. That's why it's out there for comment. Because we're, we're anxious to hear your thoughts as to uh, uh, the things that maybe we have not uh, uh, thought through. Um, the, the idea of the control group, and I've got um, Stephanie Schmidt here from IES. Really, you know, this is a, this, we, we were telling folks up front, states up front, that you've got to be willing to embrace this, this idea of a randomized study. Um, we think that the design of this study is rigorous. We think that it's going to be able to yield some very powerful uh, results. Um, we don't think that we would disadvantage students uh, to, in the control group because, and this is why GEARUP was truly selected, because GEARUP really does have a very strong financial literacy piece there. Uh, and we are, um, we're hoping that the financial literacy piece coupled with the savings account would change behavior. Um, but this is eyes wide open, meaning that the states who uh, uh, respond to the in, uh, notice inviting application understand that and that the, uh, the students and parents selected also understand that they are either part of the experimental group or the control, control mm -hmm. group. So there are no secrets at the end of the, 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 uh, the process, if you will. And, and as I understand it from the, the, the notice that uh, I looked over, uh, the control, it's by school. There's a, you're, you're either in a school that's offering this or you're in a school that's part of, part of the control. Uh, so you're not going to be kind of comparing yourself to your, your, your friend and neighbor who might have had an opportunity that you didn't get uh, access to, but also everybody will still be in the gear up program. They'll be able to get those services as well. And the other comment is this is also how, how we learn. This we try to figure out if it's effective by isolating the intervention. Um, but uh, certainly it does raise, uh, raise other, other uh, ethical issues that, that um, might be worth kind of tracking. So just two thoughts just to, to add on to that. I, I think it is the next step that we have to take, unfortunately, and having the control since we can't just kind of say, okay, we're going to do this nationally and, and just roll it out and give everybody an account. Uh, it really is the next, next natural step. We've done what we you know, can do with secondary data analysis, and we, we kind of need to make some, some, some next steps. Uh, as far as giving everybody money, I think it is a problem. You have a finite amount of money, and so even though some people might uh, save, not save, you have to assume that everybody's going to save in the beginning and that they're all going to meet their match because you have to have a certain amount of money you know, you have to allocate that money that way. Because if everybody does meet their match, then you don't have enough money if you're giving it to others who met it faster or whatever else. But there might be ways in future years, maybe the first year you have it and you have some pot of money left over at the end to allocate that for incentives or whatever else for achieving certain milestones. Or, there's lots of thought about that. So. Yeah, and that's why we're really inviting the comments uh, on that, that piece. And, and Dr. Elliott's absolutely correct. We have to make the assumption that though those 10,000 students who participate will will um, fully participate, and we are, you know, we're obligating ourselves to making that match if, if in fact that they do. But I like your idea of what happens if others accelerate and you do have extra money, and what would you do? So, I, I would like to see the structure of that comment so we could at least throw that around and see where, how it lands. And you mentioned the 529 uh, college savings plan uh, model, and, and uh, there are aspects of that plan that actually I, I like quite, quite a bit and how it provides kind of an infrastructure for savings that's existing. Currently, it goes to middle and upper income families that take advantage of it. Kevin, I know you guys have looked at that um, policy a little bit. Uh, you have some reactions to that um, opportunity of using 529s in connection with this effort? Sure. I mean, I think... Um 
the infrastructure for savings is important. I have a 529 plan, uh, and so I, I'd be a hypocrite if I said that I thought they were a bad idea. Um, um, I do think that the, I mean, it's the Treasury's, as the Treasury studies have shown that the incidents or the benefits do skew pretty, pretty hard toward the uh, 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 top side of the income distribution because those are the people who have high marginal tax rates, and that's sort of where most of the savings comes. Um, the uh, the concern I think, or the, or the risk about 529 plans that you have to mitigate is that um, uh, college going is pretty inflexible for young people. I mean, you graduate from high school and it's time to go to college, and whereas markets are inherently un unpredictable, um, and so we certainly saw uh, three uh, four years ago during the recession, a lot of people just get caught. Um, you know, if your if your student was starting college in September 2008 and you were planning on your 529 plan being the difference, I mean, you you were in trouble. And that, I mean, that just happened, and a lot of people had to delay college going. And as we all know, the research says that delaying college going is a serious risk factor for non-completion and all kinds of other problems. And so um, th that is a, a, a problem that is, uh, it's not wholly solvable. The risk can be managed if we're careful about the way that funds are invested as we kind of approach mm -hmm. the college going time. It means you give up some return, but that, I think, is, I think, the... Uh, uh, guarding against some kind of catastrophic market loss, particularly for the kind of populations we're starting, we're talking about, um, is worth it. And because there would be a, a match anyway, I, I, you know, it would still be a good a good deal for them. Yeah. Let me be very clear, though. I, I, I cer certainly hope I didn't give the impression that it was only a 529. That is <clears> just <throat> one vehicle. In the states really do have the flexibility of selecting what works best um, for them. It could indeed be a uh, 529 or any federally insured banking institution or any kind of banking instrument that they deem most appropriate for um, their particular needs. So while the 529, you know, is a is is a is in the marketplace, it's just being used here as as, as illustration. Hmm. Okay, uh, great. We'll go right here and then over there and then back there. There was one up there first. Yeah. Um, so I'm John Spader at Apt Associates, and my question is, I, I wanted to know if you could say a little bit more about um, the guidance being given to individual states on the financial education component. And it seems like there's there's a balance there between having a standardized intervention and allowing for individual states to experiment with different approaches and different types of interventions. And I'm thinking a little bit about the Assets for Independence demonstration and the amount of effort it took to build the capacity of the financial literacy provider network, um, and, and particularly the individuals that were um, acting as financial education trainers. Um, and, and part of that is it seems like there could be benefits from tapping into that network, so either finding local CCCS providers or local financial education and coaching providers. Um, and, and so I wanted to ask if you could speak to sort of what the role of TA is and how much standardization is a goal. Um, I don't think that at this point we have um, any set standards. I want you to know, though, that, that the Gear Up program already has a very strong financial literacy component. Um, for this particular, for the use of savings accounts, however, I think that what we heard when we <clears throat> published the, uh, the invitational priority talking about the use of savings accounts what we heard from the gear up community was that there was just a void there of how really to get started and, and what really to do and what, what kind of uh, uh, opportunities they would have uh, or what should they look at, you know, just, just really how do they, how do they jumpstart this engine. Um, and so what we have done with this program is provided for some of those administrative costs that are that are not normally provided for to provide that technical um, um, uh, assistance. So what we will be doing from the department's view is bringing those successful grantees, those project manager, project directors, uh, in town and really providing them a very rich program that helps them understand uh, the nuances of managing through um, these uh, savings accounts and the particulars of that. You know, one of the things that we've learned in our discretionary grant programs, particularly those that focus on states, um, are that we need to provide as much flexibility to states as possible. 
Um, they appreciate that. Uh, and so um, we are kind of capitalizing on those lessons learned in this particular program to provide that. I'm not sure I'm answering your question. And if there are any of my colleagues who feel like they can address it much more powerfully than I can, please. Uh, Step Willie, in. Though, you you, you um, have some experience working with your local Gear Up program in, um, in Kansas. Is that right? That's right. Uh, and uh, also some experience working kind of in the, in the asset building community with some of the organizations that are kind of providing uh, savings accounts. There, I think, will be opportunities for states in preparing their applications to find these partnership uh, organizations to kind of create connections that make for a compelling proposal and an application. Uh, and anyway, Willie, any experience there that you think is, is relevant to this discussion? Well, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of uh, people are using a lot of different methodologies for teaching financial literacy, a lot of different uh, curriculums. And so uh, I know even INSEP has a, their own uh, curriculum, financial literacy curriculum on their website. So I think there's, there's, there's a lot of it out there. And then it's just a matter of figuring out which one they're most comfortable with, the one they think works best and in consulting with people about that. Um, uh, kind of on that note, I mean, even, I know you talk about having two annual kind of times where they do that. I think videos and in, in tweeting also might be a component of that, uh, uh, as opposed to just the two, uh, two times a year. So that might be something they could do as well. Great. Uh, you had a question here, and then we'll come over here. Hi, uh, Mr. Carey, you can kind of address this, but I was wondering, uh, Professor Elliott, if you had some, some uh, feedback on your research. Um, does the research show that Reason Hope comes from simply having a savings account, um, or is there a discussion regarding how large the account needs to be right. compared to the cost of college? Um, you know, $1,160 doesn't cover a single credit at many colleges today. Uh, and then also, put another way, you say that two-way causation exists. There's like a savings leading to positive expectations and then positive expectations leads to savings. So how do you see or, or does the research show that, that the rising cost of, of college impacts this causal relationship and does the amount of money impact whether this study will be successful or not? Good questions. Um, and, I, and I think to some degree we need a study like this to start talking about causal relationships and these kind of things. So I can tell you more or less about the associations we see and what we think that leads to. Uh, so. Just the basic fact of using the panel study of income dynamics, which most of these studies have been done with, um, the, nationally people don't save that much, right? So there's not much savings in these accounts, uh, particularly around children. We're talking, like I said, about on average about $400, and we still see these kind of positive effects. So it would lead you to believe that it's less about the amount. And, and kind of what I was trying to uh, uh, gloss over in, in my little talk before was that what I speculate on the why that the why that is is because of something called uh, like future expectations about savings, right? So I have an account, and, and, and I understand that savings is a way to accumulate money, and I'm not going to purchase my, my, my college until down the road. And so I have these benefits just from knowing that I'm in a savings account, and at some point I believe that I'll be able to save a certain amount of money to help me with that. So you have that, right? So you start seeing effects early on in engagement. And a lot of things were, uh, like uh, Carrie talked about, was is that is this idea of getting children engaged early on in a process where a Pell Grant's much later, you get that much later, you get this much earlier on, and so they can begin to think about it and, and, and hope in these kind of ways. And then I think we have to be strategic as we move forward about how much um, practically do we want these kids to have saved up, which might mean different kind of matches. It might mean maybe volunteering in different kind of activities, having community support, like you mentioned, contributing to these accounts. But, but there does seem to be, from what we can see, uh, effects from just owning account and what people think that will do for them in the future. I, we need to have a study like this, though, that, that actually can control uh, and, and tease this out better. Does that answer your question? And, and it might be that this is some of the feedback we, uh, we offer to the department, which is, uh, you know, is this enough? Is this enough to trigger the effects, enough to trigger uh, the savings process that could accumulate resources that could make a difference? You max out, but you don't go farther you get to four figures, you get over $1,000. You know, is, is that enough? Should it be more? Uh, and uh, I've got some things I'm going to submit in 
comments uh, to this process to try to, uh, and, and I actually think that the seed is important to get it started, but, but putting more money on the table, the match, uh, uh, and also figuring out ways to incentivize other contributions from other sources, because I do think um, w you do need to build up a pool and, and maybe, you know, seven, eight hundred dollars, maybe that's not enough to trigger the effects, uh, even though we've, we've, we've shown that it, it can do uh, something. Uh, one, more thing, one more thing on it real quick. Please. I think you need to think about it as two different kinds of questions. One is, is it enough for them to pay for college, right, what they're doing? No, right? And then the other is, it, does it change their engagement and the way they think about school? So when they get to the point of college, they're in the right mindset, they're filling out phosphors, they're doing the things they've done, and they've done enough along the way that they're academically prepared, right? So, th so those are important things. And, and I, my research, I, I would think along the line you talk about adding money is maybe some kind of incentive structure, maybe that's where other money comes in, so where they can earn money for uh, achieving certain milestones, both academically and in savings-wise, to help accumulate more money. But I think they're two different questions. One is engagement, kind of a question, does it change, change their mindset? And the other is, practically, do they have enough to pay for college, and how much do we think they should accumulate during that process uh, for that, if that makes sense. And if you, if you really look at the Gear Up program in totality, and you know, I keep talking about the financial literacy aspect of that, but this is a program that really focuses on also on building the academic uh, foundation within this, these, these sets of students. And so what one would hope is that as that is, is a fundamental part of this discretionary program, grant program, and then the financial literacy piece is that somewhere along the line, this, this uh, high school student understands that there's a cost benefit associated with attending college and there are some uh, uh, activities that, that she and her family needs to be engaged in before the FAFSA uh, occurs. And then how, how do you really look at that whole completion agenda as it fits into this, this aspect as well? So, uh, you know, clearly $1,100 is, is not going to, to, um, to pay for college credit. We understand that. But it is the, the, it is the behavior and, and the, the concept that we're trying to improve in terms of, of starting to lay the groundwork that there is an expense to this, and it and it could be attainable for those um, who uh, acknowledge early on that there's there's a process involved. It, it can't go on, on said enough too. It's also this idea that um, what does it mean to a child, right, to know that a their parents are investing in them early on, that the country is investing in them early on. We talk about identity-based motivation and some of these things when we try to explain asset effects. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with that. This, this whole idea that there's this group um, uh, that believes in me and, and is investing in me, and, and, and that can have uh, effects beyond just being able to pay for college that, that I think are really important. Evelyn, I actually wanted to ask you about uh, your experience with the community colleges and, and whether or not uh, this kind of intervention would, would um, pique their interest uh, as well. Obviously, uh, if you can find ways to connect them to public benefits that can help them uh, retain their students and, and make sure their students can uh, engage, that's very attractive. Uh, but we also know that a lot of community colleges make links to uh, local high schools and other you know, feeder uh, schools, um, and uh, if this could be a way to, to make sure that there um, is also some way to be, be ready and engaged, uh, it could be something that's attractive to the community college community, uh, and maybe something that could be part of the state um, proposals for, for this kind of uh, demonstration. We, we haven't directly worked on that aspect, but I would think partnerships between community colleges and high schools would make a lot of sense in this regard. We're just, we've been focused on trying to meet the need once they get there right. and, and why they're dropping out. And, and financial need is one of the many reasons that they're uh, dropping out and working too much. But um, I think anything to help people plan for and um, feel that they're prepared, not only feel, but be prepared to, to engage in college, I think is a, a good thing. But we have not directly been involved in those um, 
discussions as, as part of these initiatives. Great. We, we have a question over there. Other hands? Let's see. Okay. Last question. Hi. I'm with the YWC of the National Capital Area's Adult Literacy Program, and I was wondering what you see as the role of adult literacy providers in all of this, and how this can help adult ed students on their path to college, and how similar programs might be implemented um, for adult literacy students. I'm glad you asked that. One of the one of the things we're really trying to accomplish through a number of these initiatives is to bridge the gap between the credit side and the non-credit side, whether it's the adult education programs or the workforce programs. And a number of the schools that have been involved in the, in the planning process actually are targeting adult education students, not just the ones that move into d developmental education, but adult education students who um, have high levels of need. Um, so we will see how that works. Uh, we've been working with the ones where community, where adult education is provided through the community colleges. We have not, um, at this point, and maybe we need to be doing that, really broaden to the, the broader adult education community. But there are quite a few states in which adult, as you know, adult education is provided through the community colleges. And they're very much part of this, these initiatives. Great. Um, okay, I did want to thank all of you for, for coming to join us uh, today. And, and Deborah, I wanted to thank you and your team for um, getting this uh, effort uh, through and over the finish line. And I, and I guess as of tomorrow, the, uh, the clock starts uh, ticking. We have, we have 30 days to um, give some feedback. Um, so thank you very much, and thank you for joining us.